Welcome and thank you for joining us um, in Imagining Chinatown 2050, a speculative futures storytelling event. Um, my name is Linda Zhang and I'm an assistant professor at Ryerson uh, University as well as a principal architect at Studio Paramount. Um, and this project is actually part of uh, a project we had planned for this month um, as part of my ZM Intersections Festival, uh, which was postponed um, this year, um, as you might all imagine, um, due to COVID-19, um, but is going to continue to take place in 2021. Uh, 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 Intersection Festival, uh, COVID-19. Um, so uh, 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 um, so we'd just like to um, start by taking a moment to express our gratitude. Uh, we want to thank you all for being here uh, with us this afternoon uh, and for embarking um, on us on the speculative futures journey. Um, we are not all on the same land, um, but today we are focusing specifically on Chinatowns. Um, so we want to express our gratitude to be working on that land. Uh, we are thankful to the original caretakers of that land. Um, and specifically here in Toronto, uh, Toronto is the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat and continues to be home to many indigenous peoples. Together we exist under the dish with one spoon territory. Um, and as we learn um, from indigenous teachings, it is our responsibility together to protect the land. More specifically, as co-facilitator Erica Kim writes in her latest article, Spadina, uh, which is where Chinatown West in Toronto is located, was named after the Anishinaabe word Ishpadina, or place on a hill which aptly describes the escarpment created by the Glacial Lake Iroquois, where the First Nations people lived for thousands of years. And while Chinatown West uh, may be what comes to mind first when thinking of Chinatown in Toronto, uh, Toronto actually has several Chinatowns on different lands, uh, both downtown and in the GTA, both existing uh, and erased. Um, so we invite you to reflect on the land of your respective Chinatowns in Toronto uh, and in beyond, uh, wherever you are joining us um, in through online right now. Uh, we invite you um, to acknowledge and learn more about the agreements of those lands and the nations um, that cared for them and lived on them. Um, if you are interested in learning more, uh, please join us in 2021 as part of our postponed Museum Intersections Festival project. Uh, T-Base will actually be leading a decolonizing Chinatown event, a storytelling event, um, and we invite you to join us then to learn more um, beyond tokenistic land acknowledgements um, and explore what gratitude can look like for Indigenous peoples, communities, nations, past, present, future, um, and the land specifically in context of Chinatown West. Um, 大家们，我谢谢你们一起参加今天我们的活动，会用啊英文去讲啊。可是要是你们啊需要翻译或者你们啊英语可能跟跟不上啊，你可以啊这个啊活动以外，你可以跟我联系，然后我们啊可以一起
you know, as a not-for-profit organization, we're dedicated to telling the stories of the city um, from different perspectives, uh, those that may be underrepresented, those that look at the past, present, and future, um, and those that uh, come from voices that maybe we haven't heard in the past and haven't heard that much before. So um, we're excited to focus on this particular project led by Linda and the project participants and, uh, uh, and partners because it really does do this past, present, and future, and it fits so well uh, into the mandate of Myzeum. Um, we're going to continue to do this over these, uh, these times, uh, over the, the COVID-19 quarantine period with other projects. So we're encouraging anybody out there to come and participate with us. Jump on our website at myzeumoftoronto.com. Visit us on social and, uh, and come with us to have these important discussions that seem to be even more important now as we're apart and find reasons and opportunities to come together. Um, and I also want to specifically thank Linda Chu and John Donald who uh, through uh, their financial support have helped make this particular project uh, possible. So I will step away and let Linda take the reins and um, look forward to having a, a great opportunity to communicate with you all today and hope that you will join us at a future Intersections project very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so just a couple notes um, for technical um, Zoom questions. Um, you will notice there is uh, there are several panelists here. We have 10 co-facilitators today. Um, you will also notice in your top right-hand corner, there is a gallery view and spotlight view function. Um, and so in the beginning introduction, um, spotlight view will likely work better. And as we get into conversation, uh, gallery view will give you access to be able to um, have uh, video uh, access to all of the uh, panelists. Um, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A um, in the bottom uh, middle bar uh, where you can uh, raise them. Um, and if you need any technical support, also please ask us um, in that platform as well. Um, so I actually would like to begin today um, by looking at some headlines. Um, so this is uh, some, some very recent headlines um, in the news earlier. Um, this week. Um, and this workshop is, is, um, has been about kind of unpacking what this meant for the community um, and working through that by thinking what it means for Chinatown um, and using the kind of genre of speculative fiction um, as a sort of tool for, to help us kind of think through those. Um, and so we see uh, various recent headlines um, and uh, even the news actually seems to be confused about how to go about this. So um, if you actually notice the link here, um, for the for this uh, global news article is actually the same one as back here. So on April 23rd, this is what the headline was for the same article. And on April 24th, they've now changed the, the, the article uh, headline, although they're both available on the same link. Um, you just can't find the other one unless you use cache. So the first title that appeared was Canadian MP demands Dr. Tan be fired, suggests she works for China. Um, they maybe quickly realized that was not the language they wanted to use as uh, global news. And so then they switched to rookie Belleville. Uh, Ontario MP gets blowback for racist comments against Canada's top doctor. Very, very different language um, uh, in the span of only uh, one day. Um, and this is uh, something where it's also not just here. Um, it's also, uh, a, these are global questions and we even see um, a recent uh, article from yesterday uh, where uh, in the UK, the Tory MPs are now deemed it necessary to examine the entire rise of China in general um, uh, as a result of these, in light of these events. Um, and so in many ways, COVID-19 has exacerbated many of those underlying beliefs, fears, and vulnerabilities that have always been present. Um, it has put a magnifying glass on inequity and disparity of systems of power um, around the world is allowed for the not so dormant hatred and prejudice to surface. Um, and if Chinatown is the physical manifestation of those relationships uh, between an ethno cultural group um, and a broader public um, to those uh, with power and those living under those systems of power, um, today we are here to think together and ask um, how will this impact uh, the future of Chinatown and its communities. Um, and so how will we, how will or should or can the Chinese community or the Asian community uh, respond to this? Um, of course, Chinatown has many communities and the communities uh, who occupy Chinatown are also um, 
very uh, diverse and don't always necessarily agree with one another. Um, another question is also how should Canadians respond? And so we see in, in these arrangement of headlines, um, a sort of gradient of varying responses um, that go from a kind of um, outward expression of, of belonging um, to ones that are more explicit othering um, and kind of tied up with uh, questions of discrimination or fear. Um, and so how can we envision through speculative fiction a more generous and expansive global response um, to these questions of how do we engage um, with marginalized communities? How do we allow ethnocultural heritage um, to sh take shape in the city and occupy public space? Um, and how do we kind of uh, tie that together with national identity? Um, while magnified, these questions are also not new um, already long before this happened. Um, there have been continued debates around the development of Chinatown, both historically and in the present moment leading up to um, uh, the events of COVID-19. Um, and so what should be uh, protected and who those preservation practices serve has always been a contested question. And so here we see um, some, a, a recent news article from uh, earlier this year um, of the uh, parody sign um, for Rolsan, which was threatened for demolition that Friends of Chinatown um, put up, um, of which two members are also co-facilitators on this event. Shout out to Shelley and Morris. Um, and uh, this struggle for development and um, what, what the developers are doing, um, who are they serving? Um, this is something that the recent work effect um, has just been calling on local developers to simply do better. And so now I would like to take us to Toronto Town, uh, sorry, Chinatown in Toronto. Um, so Chinatowns around the world have had a long history of expropriation, um, which also includes an incredible history of resilience in face of adversity. Um, in Toronto specifically, Chinatown uh, managed to outlive an expropriation from its original site, um, which is where City Hall uh, currently is today. And it was um, for the purposes of building City Hall. So there's a very clear example of uh, an ethno-cultural heritage in direct conflicts with a sense of kind of national or city heritage. We just saw in the video clip a transition um, from a very ornate Chinese element of a building to this sort of modernist uh, undifferentiated cube. Um, and in San Francisco's Chinatown, um, in, in the early days, they sort of are famously known for having hired white American architects to design and build a Chinatown that would be acceptable to Americans, easy to consume, a sort of tokenistic tourist item. Um, and it was so successful that its superficial selection of orientalized elements has become the Chinatown everywhere that we all know and love today. Um, and so in architecture, we held up our model minority status by self-orientalizing ourselves, playing up our Chinese-ness, Chinese making it consumable um, to those, the society that holds power. Um, and so what does it mean that the Chinese diaspora around the world is now constrained by its dragons and pagoda roof lines? Um, on the other hand, Andrew Yang's recent Washington Post op-ed called for Asian Americans to be more American. Um, so seemingly an opposite response, you know, hide your Chinese-ness, be more American. Um, these two responses are actually in fact the same. Both operate um, in the name of the same goal. Um, it is for the comfort of, um, in these two cases, Americans, um, or more broadly speaking, of uh, the society who holds power, um, and to continue to be uh, model Americans to mitigate any possible discomfort um, to Americans by absorbing it and internalizing it. Um, so in, in these times, you know, how should we act? Um, how should we, we as an Asian community, um, as a sort of Chinese diaspora, or, or we as Canadians, uh, or we as outsiders, depending on how you might define in or outside in which communities um, that we belong to? Um, and how have these been effective? Um, how, how, how do we begin to find alternative pathways um, towards the future? And so here is a return to the genre of speculative fiction. So I would like to start with this quote. Um, Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. 
Um, and so on this note, I would like to introduce um, co-facilitator Maxime Gertler Jaffe, um, who is also the developer of the speculative fiction uh, workshop with us, um, and for him to share some insights um, from his research and community engagement um, using this kind of genre of thinking to kind of shape uh, social imagination. Hi, everybody. And I'm just getting my screen up here. One second, please, with my presentation. Hi, so yeah, as Linda mentioned, uh, my name is Maxim. I'm a filmmaker and artist researcher uh, based in Toronto and London, England. And I'm joining you today from Toronto. And just before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that the structure of today's workshop that we were doing um, just before this takes inspiration from the work of others, including um, two people, Adrienne Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha, who are the editors of Octavius Brood, which is a collection of speculative fiction written by American social justice movement leaders of color as well as Alex Kaznovich and Max Haven, who are the conveners of the Radical Imagination Project, which was based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We're also building a bit on work that I did with a group of Jewish youth in London, England a couple of years ago, uh, running speculative writing workshops there. What excites me about writing speculative fiction is that you're giving yourself permission to imagine the impossible or improbable. Writing speculative fiction, we're imagining things that people have told us could never be or shouldn't be, or we are expressing points of view that don't normally have a place in the world, because maybe they have a place in other worlds or other times. Speculative fiction writing allows our imagination to run wild and allows us to imagine the world as we understand it to be or would like it to be. So, just to take a second to actually define what we're talking about as we're talking about speculative fiction. The ro writer Robert Heinlein said that speculative fiction operates in three modes. It can say, what if, if only, and if this goes on. Put another way, these modes are, what if this is what were to happen, if only this could happen, or this will be the fallout if what's going on now continues. Uh, Margaret Atwood, who many of us are probably familiar with, uh, has written several books that could be considered speculative fiction, such as Oryx and Crake or The Handmaid's Tale. And she says that speculative fiction is about things that could really happen, but just hadn't completely happened when the authors wrote the books. So she understands her works of speculative fiction to be grounded in possible futures, things that could come to pass eventually. So just a few other examples of speculative fiction. Um, as I mentioned, Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake, uh, which briefly is about a future Earth where genetic engineering and mutations have taken over the world, and there's only one member of the human race uh, left alive. Another classic example of speculative fiction is Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, which is about two neighboring planets, one occupied by anarchists and the other by capitalists, and looks at what happens when the two begin interacting with each other. It's a, a very simplified summary of that book, but uh, keeping it brief. Uh, another uh, classic example of speculative fiction that I think is particularly appropriate for the pandemic and would really encourage people to read is Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, which is about a future United States where society has collapsed due to inequality and climate change and uh, follows a protagonist who's a young woman who must salvage community from the ruins of the country. Finally, I mentioned uh, the Octavius Brood Project, and out of that came this uh, collection of speculative fiction stories written by activists in American social justice movements, uh, who, as I mentioned, wrote their stories in writing workshops very similar to the one that we did earlier. So um, a lot of our ideas for what we've been doing in these workshops uh, come from their work. Quickly, another term that I want to define here is visionary fiction, which is specifically a type of speculative fiction defi uh, defined by the editors of Octavius Brood, who were the conveners of those workshops that I mentioned and, and who edited that anthology. Adrienne Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha define, define visionary fiction as a term to distinguish science fiction that has relevance toward building new, freer worlds from the mainstream strain of science fiction. 
which most often reinforce dominant narratives of power. Brown considers SF an exploring ground, providing the opportunity to play with different outcomes and strategies before we have to deal with the real world costs. And here's just a quick clip of Alita Imarisha saying a bit more about this, and I'll just make sure you can all hear my sound before I press play. Here we go. Our idea behind that, my co-editor Adrian Mary Brown and, and I, was uh, to have sci uh, science fiction written by organizers, visionaries, change makers, activists. Because what we realized and what we felt was that all organizing is science fiction. Right? Dreaming of worlds where there's no poverty, where there's no prisons, where there's no police or police violence, um, where there's no you know, heterosexism, where there's no patriarchy and oppression, that's science fiction, right? That doesn't exist. None of us have ever seen that. But being able to collectively dream of those worlds actually allows us <clears throat> to collectively begin to build those worlds into reality. So we think everyone who engages in any sort of organizing is already a science fiction creator. And conversely, we feel like our movements for social change desperately need science fiction. They need a space to break beyond the boundaries of what we're told is realistic change, right? Okay, so she says it better than I ever could. Um, and briefly what she's mentioning there, she's talking about um, dreaming as speculative fiction, uh, thinking about uh, speculative fiction as building alternative worlds that we maybe would like to come, have, have come to pass, and also drawing from the past or present to envision a different future. All of these things are, are ways of doing speculative fiction. So in this workshop that we held earlier today, um, we had a group of, of individuals uh, trying their hand at writing speculative fiction. Um, and you know, it's, it's quite difficult to sit down and just start writing a story out of nowhere. So we took people through a process. Um, first, we began by defining the setting. So we were looking at what Chinatown would look like in 2050. Um, this is where our stories were set. So we were asking what's uh, happening in this world that is going to allow us to address some of the issues that we want to talk about in our stories. Um, is Toronto's Chinatown West uh, in 2050 still at Spadina and Dundas? Maybe there's a new Chinatown, maybe it's moved to suburbia, or maybe it's even moved off planet. Maybe Chinatown doesn't exist anymore. We also talked about the rules of the world. So this, uh, you know, we have new rules that have been introduced into our world recently, right? With social and physical distancing. Um, so we were asking 30 years from now, um, what are the rules in terms of, of politics, in terms of how people are interacting with each other, but also in terms of how time works? What does the environment look like? What science and technology are available to people? Um, are, are there even beings with, with magical or superpowers? Uh, do we have the interactions with other creatures, beings, you know, just opening it up uh, in this imaginative way to kind of allow ourselves to imagine things differently than they are now and to kind of, of untether ourselves from the restrictions of our, our present moment. We also thought about the atmosphere of our worlds, and this is really important when you're writing stories, because these are the sensory descriptive aspects of the world that actually really allow us to kind of understand what it would feel like to be in this world, to be a character in this world. And, and thought about the backdrops as well. So in the case of this workshop, um, our backdrop of our world is the current pandemic. So we're thinking about COVID-19 challenges and how Chinatown in 30 years reflects how the world might have responded to the pandemic. Once we had our worlds, we asked people to think uh, in terms of conflict. So what, what's, a conf what's the central issue disrupting this world? Who's seeking change in this world? Who's seeking to prevent this change? Um, these questions allow us to kind of pull all the pieces together for the story um, and allow us to, to place future characters in the setting and think about what the characters uh, need to do, what the forces are that they're working against and working with. So our conflicts questions also asked, you know, what role the natural world played, um, what role humans play, what, what role governments play, um, how the need for change becomes clear, how change happens, and who's ultimately going to make change happen. After figuring this out as a group, we moved to individual writing. 
and each uh, participant of the workshop uh, had a chance to think about a character through which they'd be telling their story. Uh, it's through this character's point of view that we understand the world, understand the conflict, and, and try to address the conflict. So, you know, character can include um, people of, of any age, religion, ability, gender, um, it can even be multiple people. Um, but this is, this is the person through which we're understanding the world and approaching the conflict. Finally, we thought about how, how the conflict might get solved or, or not solved, but, but what the character might try to do to, to, to influence this conflict. Um, I think shortly we're going to be talking about the, the worlds and, and we might even hear a story um, from, from one of the participants. I would just encourage everybody as we're listening to the story to think about some of these things that I mentioned. You know, what are the, what are the rules of the world? What, what are the, what's the POV? What are the themes? And, and what's the writer trying to achieve through the choices that they've made? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maxim, for um, that great introduction to speculative fiction. Um, so I'm now going to uh, introduce all of our panelists. Um, so if I could get everyone to uh, turn their videos on, that would be great. Let me just give everybody a minute to check in. Um, and as they're doing that, I just wanted to explain that um, today's workshop uh, was structured uh, in two parts. Uh, Maxim mentioned this already. First, a collective uh, world building exercise that was done together, and then um, an individual uh, writing um, and uh, character building part. Um, and all of this was led by uh, 10 co-facilitators in five groups. Um, and so I'm going to actually be introducing um, your facilitators um, in their pairs. Um, and so I'll ask you guys to just uh, kindly introduce um, yourselves, but also um, together to share with us um, something sort of unexpected that emerged um, from your kind of collective world building or the sharing of, of the individual stories uh, from your particular group. Um, so today we'll start with um, Shelly Zhang, who's joining us from Toronto, um, who's a multi multi multidisciplinary artist, and also Biko Mandela Gray, uh, who's based in Syracuse, who is assistant professor of African American religion, and whose research looks at such social movements as Black Lives Matter. Okay. Um, I'm happy to go first. So yeah, Biko and I had a really great session with our, our, our group. We, we landed on this interesting metaphor of a, something one of our participants described as hot pot politics. And I love a good food political metaphor, but what I thought was really interesting about defining a Canadian society in the lens of say a hot pot metaphor is that it's so against the grain, for example, um, with the U.S. euphemism of, uh, you know, the U.S. is a big melting pot kind of situation. And so <laughs> we went into a bit of the surreal, I suppose, with our food metaphor. So some of our attendees wrote some really lovely surreal pieces, um, but sort of thinking perhaps what is the difference between uh, this combination of a pot sharing of it, um, what are the components that make it, what are the divisions and in individual pieces of it, what adds flavor to this pot, those were sort of the, uh, the conversations we were having. Biko, did you want to add anything to that? I know it was, I, I just wanted to say hello everyone, it's great to be here and uh, we just had a blast thinking about uh, the relationship between uh, ideas of food and comfort um, in terms of futurity and so questions of relationships and hot pot politics as a sort of comparative thing. Also there are some religious dimensions there and um, and yeah so I just wanted to add that into the conversation. It seems like we've got a few questions in the Q&A. Vita thank you for your comments uh, and I think if you click on the gallery view you'll be able to see us I believe uh, so that way you can see all of us collectively uh, for Sarika. All right I'm gonna go ahead and get off now. Thank you. Um, and so uh, our next two co-facilitators are Erica and Morris. Erica Kim is an architectural historian based in Toronto, uh, and Morris Lam is a photographer based in Toronto. 
Yeah, so um, not surprisingly, we also talked quite a bit about food um, in Chinatown and our sort of associations and experiences with it. And there are two things that came out that were interesting. One, um, that so we, we were a bit slow to actually do the world building because we just, everyone just wanted to talk about Chinatown and what's going on and just sort of share, you know, their experiences and their worries and concerns. And so it was really great to have um, some space for that. Um, but then we had to sort of move quickly along to our world building and we started to imagine this world that was um, even more diverse uh, in terms of a Chinatown, but even more extreme in its sort of system of othering and sort of thinking about these sort of hard lines, boundaries between different identi identities and the way they're policed. And so we sort of settled on this world where um, food becomes um, very politicized, uh, this idea that food production becomes more regulated. And so um, some of our uh, group members started to develop characters who are sort of renegades, um, resistors, um, sort of trafficking in contraband foods, um, both sort of uh, meat products as well as, you know, gardens that you um, grow medicinal herbs in your backyard. Um, but then there's sort of a state regulated market where all of the um, grocers have to sell uh, their fresh produce in this market. And then all of the shops are just for restaurants. And so trying to imagine um, different types of activities that would occur um, to sort of imagine how you could resist this additional othering that's happening in response to uh, the pandemic. So it was, a, it was, I think it was a lot of fun. I've never laughed so much uh, listening to these uh, speculative fictions. So I really appreciate that. Morris, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I just, um, I thought it was really insightful to hear from different perspectives, particularly from um, different Chinatowns throughout uh, North America, just in terms of our group. So, it was nice to sort of see that commonality in challenges um, facing COVID right now. Um, I just wanted to address one of the Q&A questions. Um, so for those of you who are still having trouble switching to gallery view, um, in the top right hand corner, um, there is a button for enter full screen and beside it there's a button that says either says speaker view or says gallery view. If you click that you can toggle between the two views. Um, if you are still having trouble, keep hitting us up um, in the Q&A and we will uh, walk you through it. Um, so for our next group, uh, we have uh, Howard and Lexi. Howard Tam is a strategic designer and urban planner uh, based in Toronto. Um, and Lexi Tian is actually joining us from New York, uh, where she is an architect and assistant professor. Cool. Um, thank you so much for having us and, and thank you, Linda, um, and all the other organizers. Um, yeah, we had such a fun discussion. Um, like we all, for some reason, all started talking about our favorite bakeries like right away for some reason. And um, I think one thing that was super interesting was about how like the participants that like were from Buenos Aires and, and um, Brooklyn to like Ottawa, like, I mean, we all just had really different experiences of what is actually defined as Chinatown. So people who grew up with plazas all their life that they realized were called Chinatowns or people who, um, you know, go to a grocery store where it doesn't actually have a name. It's just in Buenos Aires, it's apparently the name of the person who runs it. So the grocery store is called Maria, for example. Um, I think one thing that was really interesting about world building was that we started to find um, ways that we could write each other into the, the actual narratives themselves. We happen to have somebody in our group whose name is Emperatrice, and um, that seemed like her being in a bakery seemed like a really interesting setting for all of us. Um, we had some really interesting discussions too about like, you know, the boundaries of where kind of private or commercial space really bleeds into public space, especially in Chinatowns as well. Howard, did you have anything? Uh, hi, Howard. Um, yeah, no, I think that, that, thank you for that summary, Lexi. Uh, yeah, it was a really great group and uh, uh, it just made me think a lot about um, like how, like how, how does sort of, like what is like, I think there's even a question in the Q&A, but like what, what defines Chinatown? How, where, where does Chinatown end and where do other neighborhoods begin? Uh, I guess as, a, as an urban planner, I, I often think about these things uh, and also as uh, someone who's involved in a lot of um, 
cultural projects, like how do you define what that district looks like? Uh, is it the last Chinese shop? That's the end of it. Uh, or like, how does that sort of lead into the city? And I think especially it's interesting. Uh, so I do a lot of work with uh, sort of suburban Chinatowns here in Toronto. Um, and for those of you who are from Toronto, you'll know that, um, you know, in the suburbs, there are just many Chinese shops scattered all over the place. So um, where does Chinatown exist there? Um, kind of an interesting question. Yeah, it was really nice for participants to be able to ask each other, like, does this sound good in Chinese or is this the right translation and stuff like that. So the collective world building was really fun for us. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, so uh, we did just get an update that apparently you all in the audience do not have control over which view you're in, but have now been switched over to gallery view. So thanks for keeping us uh, updated in the Q&A. Um, our fourth group is Tyler and Philip. Um, Tyler Fox is a community services, ugh, community services professional and social sector consultant based in London, UK, uh, but she's actually from Toronto. Um, and Philip Poon is an architect and artist based in New York City. Philip, you are still on mute. Okay, sorry. So um, in our group, we started thinking about the time frame of 30 years as kind of three decades, a very specific kind of frame to position ourselves in, and kind of what has changed in the last 30 years since 1990, and thinking about how that might inform how we see uh, 2050. So I think this naturally led us to think about um, each generation, and we talked about how generation, each generation experiences Chinatown differently, and also how each generation tells different, tells stories differently. So maybe an older generation might tell stories through like gossip, whereas future generations might tell stories through platforms based or built by Google. And then it was just also really fun to think about how older generations might experience future Chinatowns or how future grandchildren might experience future Chinatowns. And so it was, it was fun to like think about these timeframes um, in relationship to 30 years and um, thinking about how the racism that has ex existed 30 years ago has kind of set the stage for what we're seeing today given COVID-19, but you know, how Asian American history or Canadian Asian history has existed long beyond 30 years also. Yeah, um, and I think uh, I also really enjoyed um, seeing kind of participants playing between, or sort of with the spectrum kind of between utopia and dystopia and, and thinking through how um, some of the same narratives could be reflected through kind of different outcomes that are would be associated with, with each of these potential futures. Um, so we had, um, yeah, sort of one, one participant exploring how the same storyline can be articulated in, into two separate dimensions. So for example, one where Chinatown becomes kind of the center of pandemic preparedness and one where it becomes a kind of separate walled enclave isolated from sort of Canadian and, and, and American pandemics. Um, and, and yeah, just seeing how, how people were playing with that spectrum throughout um, was, was really interesting. Great. Um, and so uh, last but not least um, is the group that Maxine and myself um, led. Um, and I actually think that um, I'll first let Maxine um, maybe uh, Oh, he already introduced himself, Never mind. Um, so what we're gonna do actually is um, walk you through um, an example of how that workshop was run. And so we're gonna walk you through what kind of collective uh, world building looked like. Um, and then um, if we have um, from our group a participant who um, is happy to share uh, their story, then um, we'll also do a short uh, reading um, or a sort of um, description of that, that story as well. Um, so you can imagine we have shifted this workshop, which previously never happened online before, um, online. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, share screen now um, to move us over to the kind of digital space in which we did this collective world building exercise. Um, and I'll um, let Maxim kind of speak to that while I kind of navigate you through it. All right. Sure um, thing. Hold on. Is this sharing the right screen? Yes, it is. Okay. So what you're looking at right now, it's a it's a tangled web of ideas, but this is um, 
the, the traces of our, our world building exercise on the left hand side here. Um, and you can see that participants together were coming up with uh, some of these different aspects of the world that I mentioned earlier. So uh, thinking about the setting, the rules, the conflict, and, and the background, what's happening behind the scenes. Um, one setting that people really seemed to run with was uh, an idea that maybe the Chinatown gates would have been extended into walls that would surround all of Chinatown. as kind of an, ex an extension of, t of the logic of today's social distancing and physical dis distancing. And so we talked about uh, what that might mean in terms of uh, uh, the isolation of the community from the rest of the world. You know, on the one hand, maybe this means that the community has a, a certain level of, of protection, um, but, but on the other hand, it, it means isolation as well. Um, we asked who, who, who built the walls. Um, some, some suggested that this wasn't actually an aggressive act, but a defensive act from the community. Uh, and that it might have actually led to uh, a series of other kind of um, uh, community initiatives having to start up as the community becomes more reliant on each other, uh, people having to build, uh, uh, kind of extend on the existing uh, gardens in their backyard as, as the, the homes of Chinatown kind of turn more to, towards farming, for example. Um, uh, some other interesting ideas that came up uh, included um, a, a rise of informal economies, different types of currency. People talked about, you know, what if time was a form of currency? We talk now about um, the privatization of healthcare and, and the ability of people who can pay extra to, to access more extensive healthcare. What if that logic also um, extended to time and people could, you know, just walk into a shop and, and buy more time much like you can walk in and buy a phone card, a top up for your phone. Um, what else did we talk about? We also talked about uh, uh, physical objects um, becoming more prevalent and this idea that um, as th that these inf informal economies might also um, uh, include trade in important symbolic physical objects that would be the main marker of people's political and social ideologies. Uh, that we would no longer use um, racialized identities or, or other markers of identity, but instead you might have, have a, there might be a black mar market for objects that would do this kind of work of differentiation and grouping. Um, some of these objects might include uh, statues that would um, have ancestral connections and allow people to access uh, uh, ancestral spirits that would have more influence on the world. Linda, is there anything else you'd like to add that, that came up? Um, I think what I would add is uh, I thought what was interesting um, during this section is also um, many of these things um, actually uh, are actually things that it currently exist or actually almost as things um, kind of strangely function in, in, in Chinatown, um, but in the kind of projective speculation of them, uh, they sort of make them um, come to light in the sort of uh, speculative fiction. So for instance, the sort of informal sharing economy. Um, those are things that are, you know, already happening. Um, but to frame it as something where, you know, you can literally buy time and it adds an extension, you know, to your life lifeline of, you know, two months or uh, two days. Um, it, it kind of frames it in a different way that sort of also opens up um, the ability to ask uh, questions about sort of banal quotidian things. Um, and kind of pull out um, the kind of extraordinariness of our everyday. Um, and so maybe we will actually, um, if Reese is um, there um, and can share her audio, um, maybe we can have her um, either share her story or a summary of her story. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. One second. Okay, I think it's working. Yeah, you're all good. <laughs> awesome. Um, so following this workshop, um, also thank you very much for um, just that. Reese, you have gone on mute again. Oh, this is, okay, interesting. I think, okay, for now it's working. So I'll just- Yeah, turn all good. Okay. Um, but yeah, thank you for um, setting this up. This was really such a lovely like workshop and it was very interesting. But um, in terms of what 
um, I personally sort of built from this was sort of um, for, I guess, like the, the bones of what I would then um, develop further on following this workshop. Um, I established my setting as being, um, as Linda mentioned, Chinatown as um, sort of a space or a community that is socially distanced from the city, so split from Toronto in 2050. And there is that informal economy that is made up of icons of culture. So um, this extending not only from Chinese culture with like statues or um, lucky cats or fans, but also from any other culture that sort of once existed within Toronto or does exist. And so um, this informal economy is based on the fact that these icons of culture possess unexplained spiritual powers that grant the owner more time. Um, and so with the um, demand outweighing the supply, um, there is sort of that um, need for more and there, there leads to like a black market situation that um, gets brought up in this world. And so um, this whole sort of um, story that um, I thought of was more so um, to go with the theme of um, like nationalism and inclusion and whether or not they um, are divergent or do they have to be because going back to the characters that um, like I sort of thought of as of right now the two main characters would be um, a souvenir shop owner so this would be sort of a older figure who has survived COVID-19 and so being that um, the informal economy is made up um, of like icons of culture this this role has become more so more powerful than once before. And so it's almost become like a police officer or something even greater than that. And um, these artifacts of memorabilia that were once sort of representative of travel are now even political statements showing like, oh, what um, culture do I want to associate myself with um, through the symbols of culture that you choose to own? And also the second character is the daughter of this um, souvenir shop owner and sort of confused about whether or not the way that she lives is better um, than the life her parent lived from before the quote unquote split from um, Toronto. And so yeah, the themes being um, that with the demands to select a culture or choose a side, uh, what if someone is sort of in between both being like for example, like being Chinese and Canadian or um, whether or not there is sort of a middle ground and is there a need to um, sort of restrict a culture only to these like um, symbols of them, almost like reducing a culture to just symbols of them and whether or not that does the culture justice, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Rice. Um, so I think in, in our group, it was interesting to see um, the sort of relationship that um, different people had personally to different objects and how they sort of imagined that might play out. Um, so as another example, there was um, a story which looked at um, in 2050, the Chinatown uh, gate had just burned down in 2049. Um, and there was a sort of large debate about um, how it should, should it be reconstructed or how should it be reconstructed? Um, and what it should be reconstructed as, um, you know, has Chinatown gotten to a place that is uh, preserved in terms of heritage enough that you would actually reconstruct the gate? Um, would you actually uh, reproduce it, reconstruct it as a hologram so that you could turn it on? What is the role of digital artifacts by then? Um, what is the space that it's sort of allowed to, um, to occupy? Um, Max, is anything you wanted to add for, from our group? No, I think that's great. Thank you. Um, so now that we've kind of done an icebreaker um, introduction and also given the audience a bit of a glimpse into uh, the kind of process um, of, the, of the writing, um, I just wanted to open this up to um, an informal kind of panel discussion. Um, we won't do a formal Q&A section. It will just sort of flow into um, the conversation um, that we all have. Um, and I have written um, some prompts to the panelists. Um, if you want to respond to those as well.
So I'll just read some of the prompts um, out loud then. Um, so how has the workshop changed your relationship to the present? Are there new ways in which you might act? Um, for those from the Chinese community, can you share how through your story you envision a different response to prejudice and hatred? What challenges did you identify for Chinatown in 2050 and how did they overcome or did they overcome your main characters? I can see Biko edging to say something. I'll start actually. Um, I haven't really done any uh, creative writing since high school, so that was new for me. Um, I used to be a bit of a, a writer, but uh, for me, I think this process changed my relationship to the present in that uh, my research into uh, Chinatown businesses and the vernacular commercial architecture is sort of ongoing. And so I've been documenting the commercial spaces for several years now. And I just went out recently to photograph some of the buildings. And of course, everything is closed up and there are all these gates and, and things sort of trying to protect these businesses. And it just reminded like that's fairly heavy, just thinking about sort of the informal and gray economy and the way in which a lot of these businesses are going to slip through the cracks in terms of any sort of um, publicly funded kind of economic supports. Um, and I know that there are organizations like FOCT that are trying to bring some of that support to the community. But um, this storytelling process brought a little levity back into um, how I'm relating to the present. I think people are getting a bit, you know, it's, it's very difficult, very challenging period. And so imagining these uh, speculative futures where um, resistance is possible, where these activities are unfolding um, with a lot of humor, I think, um, sort of reminded me of sort of the power of storytelling and of creative writing um, and sharing sort of in real time. And so that sort of reminded me to sort of maintain a, a sense of levity throughout it, sort of maintain that sense of humor um, when things get pretty heavy. So I really that was sort of eye-opening to me, um, sort of reminding myself of, of that humorous aspect um, and trying to find that as like a, a force for change uh, in terms of thinking about the research I will do sort of moving forward. I, I, I was just gonna, um, in terms of thinking about the relationship to the future, there's just a bunch of really good, well, there's, a, there's a few really good questions that are sort of showing up in the q and I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I, I, I would say, um, and I'll respond to that initial question about our re future by way of responding to uh, Michelle Tan's question in the Q&A. What came up for us quite a bit was the what if. Um, that seemed to be the biggest sort of pattern is what if other things were possible. And one of the things that we sort of really thought through, um, I think we kind of went a different approach to this, was kind of like affectively, how do, you, how do we feel when we see certain objects or colors? And how, how, how might we think about how certain um, color schemes could be re-envisioned, re-imagined? Questions show, showed up in relation to religion and politics. And it wasn't merely just an exercise about food, but really the sort of color schemes that come with certain um, stereotypically um, repre stereotypical representations of Chinese food and how that might shift in the future and how, that, how we might have a different approach to it. And so I think for me, and I won't speak for um, Shelley here, uh, but, but one of the things that I was super excited about was the capacity for us to re-envision uh, a what if with humor, um, with smiles on our faces, with the capacity to think about difficult problems um, and expansive um, futures and expansive worlds without falling or collapsing into a certain kind of um, taking this so seriously that we could not um, envision otherwise possibilities. And so we found different ways to move in that way. And this is something that we see with Adrian Marie Brown's work. This is something that we, of course, see with the collector for Octavia, Octavia's Brood, as well as some of Octav Octavia Butler's work um, herself, that it's steeped in a certain kind of um, what we might call controlled optimism, a kind of joy that's tempered by um, concern and caution. And this was just a wonderful way for us to think about that um, uh, in, 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 in conversation and in collectivity. Yeah, actually, Vico, if I can jump off on that, um, you know, I'm a pretty type A personality kind of person at times. And I think what I learned from a lot of our participants is that um, being able to work 
in the abstract is actually really grounding. You know, I know of some of the things that we talked about prior to this workshop were examples of speculative fiction and pop culture that resonated really, really well, despite having, if you, you know, maybe spelled it out, it kind of doesn't make sense. Um, you know, we talked a lot about The Last Airbender as a form of speculative fiction. We talked about um, examples like The Midnight Gospel, which recently came out in it's kind of really great to be able to um, not necessarily think of our future as a direct correlation between A and B and to almost disregard the, the logistics and, and just imagine. Um, and so that I think is a really helpful, for me that was a really helpful exercise is to think of even the boundaries which um, we're not aware of taking over our everyday lives. I actually think that point also um, speaks to several um, comments um, in the Q&A as well. Um, so one comment was um, with regards to, um, from Deirdre, the overall history of Chinatown. Um, how does the overall history of Chinatown affect speculative fiction over the next 30 plus years? Um, and I think that's the aspect of speculative fiction that we were all um, so engaged with is the fact that um, it's not seen as linear, as Shelley um, was describing, where the future is also made up of the past, um, and it, time is kind of more cyclical, but also simultaneously multiples. There's multiple possible futures that could happen at any, any moment. There could also be multiple possible pasts. And um, the present that we have experienced and the past that we have experienced is only one actuation of all of those kind of magnitudes of possibilities. And so they inform and entangle um, each other and are sort of part of one wholeness um, of time in a way, um, which also speaks to kind of Michelle Tan's question um, about she identifies three models for how we might kind of um, uh, think through uh, this genre, uh, the what if, the if only, and the if this goes on. Um, and so um, what we focused on mostly um, was the what if. And so the what if is it operates in this kind of realm of the plausible. Um, so it's only like one thing that's kind of off. Um, and the one thing, the sort of like, what if this, then all of this other stuff, um, allows you to sort of do everything else with total seriousness and investigate um, and interrogate those kinds of um, aspects of, of kind of the present everyday life. Um, but it also frees you um, in a certain way to really work out and explore something um, that otherwise you might brush off as a, um, just as an impossibility and not kind of complete that thought, um, which is different from the um, if only, because uh, that is um, less speculative, um, and if this goes on, um, which is maybe um, in the degree of impossibility to completely probable, um, too close to the probable. And so the what if sort of hits a certain uh, mark in between um, those markers. Um, and there was a last comment, but I am, I will find it later and pull it back in um, and allow the group. I was, if it, is it okay for, uh, there was one comment from, there's a Q and A and I just, I thought it was a really good one that people might be able to respond to. Um, I believe it was Annie Wong's question about um, white authorship um, and how speculative futures get envisioned. So I just wanted to open that up to the panel. I think we're running on time, but just wanted to open that up as well. Um, so if everyone in the audience has a chance to read Annie Wong's comment, I think it's um, uh, really well um, written in, in the comments. Um, I will speak to um, a, a question of white authorship that actually is from our group, and it's actually from um, one of my research assistants who is working um, on this project with me. Um, and I, so I think she's very... Um, critical and um, aware of um, her relationship to this and her story, the first sentence of her story actually starts with, uh, in 2050, I am an aging white female architect living in a condo off Spadina near Chinatown West. Um, and it, it kind of goes on actually to say, I've watched the world do with unimaginable social, cultural, and environmental losses. And I'm trying to foster more inclusion, collaborative, collective participation in all things that I do. By this point, the global trade economy has slowed somewhat for environmental and social reasons. I think the cultural tensions are higher between cultural groups, um, POCs, as things become politically more polarized between people. How do I contribute to the evolution of shared spaces in Chinatown uh, when I do not belong culturally? Um, so I think this is, you know, it definitely is one of the questions and um, the projections. Um, one of the things that 
I find very empowering about speculative fiction, which is also what you have identified um, in terms of, um, in, Annie, in Annie's comments, um, often in the genre of speculative fiction by white authors, we are used uh, as exoticized backgrounds, um, Blade Runner, um, in what ways, if at all, did um, the participants work with or against the historic and current practice? And there's, and she also kind of speaks to the way in which those projections actually then do become our realities. Um, and I think that's the really important thing. And so in the act of projecting a possible future, um, there are ways that that is being projected into the present and into the minds of the present and sort of acti activating a sort of like social imagination or kind of possibility and sort of bringing um, that back. And so I think it's, it is a really um, kind of important question of like, uh, I think that sort of brings attention, that brings out that tension even of in the reconstruction of, of, a, of a Chinatown gate, what is the role of what would be allowed? What is the role of the support of allies? What is the role? It's fundamentally about this sort of um, working out of this, this uh, interaction between um, a nation um, and its ethno-cultural minorities, which also make up the nation and how that can possibly be included because we still haven't really arrived at a situation of um, post-nationhood. Um, if I can just add one thing, um, what was really in response to kind of Annie's question about uh, white authorship in framing Chinatown, you know, some of, some of the stories and some of the headlines that some of our participants wrote reframed it in terms of China becomes a leader in a way that currently the West is. So like one of the kind of imaginary headlines that someone wrote was like, China becomes a leader in human rights. So like in this kind of mindset of, it's no longer the West defining the East, but there's a future where the East can redefine the West. And maybe if this workshop were to happen in 2050, there would be the opposite question asked of why, um, why the West is always portrayed in a certain way by Chinese filmmakers or. Um, so I believe we are um, reaching our time and we'll need to wrap up soon, but I just wanted to give a chance to any of the panelists who haven't had a chance to speak if they wanted, if they had anything um, that they still wanted to share. I think that it's really interesting to to consider how you know Chinatown, as we've kind of come to understand it, um, was you know a way of resilience through kind of self exoticizing, and that pulls you in two different directions that are really interesting in terms of how we portray it, um, you know, in terms of speculative fiction or as it you know defines itself through food or defines itself through the ways that people associate with Chinatown, and so. I think it's going to be really interesting to see in 2050, like how that is either reinforced or upended in different ways. And I think so much more of the Chinatown is is what hasn't really been represented in lots of media, which is really just kind of the everyday stories that are so diverse. And even the, part the participants and like the number of participants in this um, workshop is just like really heartening to understand what their individual stories are from or are, are like. So. I mean, it was a really great experience, and I think it's it's an interesting thing to consider how to, you know, resist, but also, um, you know, kind of multiply all the meanings that that we can kind of derive power from. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I hope I think what we all hope that um, you can all get as a public um, out of uh, joining us and uh, this this sharing event. Um, is sort of an insight to this way of thinking, um, this way of writing, um, and we also invite you to kind of go and read um, some speculative fiction. Uh, we will send out an email uh, with some links um, to some suggested uh, reading that we all really love, um, and we hope that it can also um, help you in your practice of, um, you know, returning to the um, Roy quote from the beginning, um, how do we move through this portal um, and how do we move through it lighter, um, not carrying the prejudice and the hatred of the past. Um, and so we hope that this kind of um, gives you an insight to a sort of uh, line of departure for a different kind of thought. Um, I just wanted to close um, in saying uh, many, many thank yous. Um, so thank you so much uh, to the audience for being here. 
to our participants um, for joining with us on this ride through this first time online version um, and troubleshooting uh, with us to all of the joys of figuring out how to do things digitally. Um, I wanted to say uh, a thank you to um, all of our uh, facilitators. Um, this uh, has emerged out of um, lots of long conversations we've had together um, around these issues and kind of issues that uh, we care about and um, sometimes don't know um, what or how to um, do something uh, with or about. Um, I also would uh, like to say a, a, a very warm thank you to Henry Hung Lu, who helped us with all of the translations of the workshop documents um, into Chinese, not the easiest terms to translate always. Um, and then um, finally, of course, um, a big thank you to uh, Myzeum um, for giving us the space and the invitation and the opportunity um, to kind of be able to put something like this together and um, also still be able to connect um, even though uh, the original programming had been postponed and kind of um, find some space for, for generosity um, and expansion. Um, I really appreciate also all the comments and the Q&As that are coming through. There are some really amazing questions and comments that I wish we had more um, time to, to expand and connect, um, but we, I'm sure we would all love to be um, in, in touch with all of you. So if you have more questions or you want to be involved or you want to um, come by the Museum Intersections Festival Project um, Chinatown uh, in 2021, um, please, you know, follow up with me or my ZM um, to get more information there as well. Um, and so just to close, um, I will hand things um, back over to my ZM uh, to Jeremy. Thanks, uh, Linda. I really uh, appreciate it. Again, I'll just echo Linda's thanks to, to all of you. It felt like that time went by really fast and we only scratched the surface on what I think is uh, obviously a, a great number of uh, different discussion points we can continue to have and we'd love to continue to facilitate it at Myzeum. Um, it's a weird time I mean, that we're always obviously going through here and I think seeing all your faces Having, you know, we had over 160 participants at one point uh, during this 40 minutes or 45 minutes um, is, um, gives us a wonderful feeling that there is room for this important dialogue and that we can spend part of our Saturday afternoons discussing this. But I think it's only a starting point. I think Linda, as you've um, indicated and others on the panel have as well. So hope we continue and we can continue to help facilitate these discussions and dialogue moving forward. Um, we uh, just wanted to give you also a heads up that we have another uh, program that's in the series of Art in the Age of COVID. Uh, we had our first uh, event this past Wednesday, which went very well. It was a spirited discussion. We're having part two next Wednesday, so April 29th at 2 p.m. So hoping everybody can uh, book some time in their afternoon to join us on that. And then please just uh, continue to, to follow us not only web and social, but uh, all of our uh, newsletters now that we have uh, going or every week will give you a good update on what's happening, uh, what we're hearing from the public and what we're hearing from uh, those that have participated in the various uh, events, but also just give everybody an update about what we're up to. So we're hoping everybody can subscribe to those as well. So thank you again uh, for everybody, again, for your um, participation, your leadership and your uh, enthusiasm and energy uh, today. We're really excited that this went so well. Uh, have a great rest of the day and uh, we'll see you again really soon, I hope.